Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, BSF Canada, and Syngenta Canada. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Real Agriculture. Today, I'm at the University of Guelph, uh, catching up with uh, Ontario weed specialist Mike Cobra. Mike's got some news for us today. Uh, not the best of news, but um, I'll let him share it. Mike, we've got a new weed in Ontario. Yeah, I think we thought this day was going to come for a while now, but uh, it is here. We found for the first time in a field in Ontario, Wellington County, the presence of uh, Palmer amaranth, so a member of the pigweed family, uh, a weed that's uh, been a problem in the U.S. for, for quite some time now. So, Mike, you, you mentioned U.S. farmers have been wrestling with this weed for about 30 years. It's now, you know, crossed the border. How did it get here? Yeah, I think the truth of the matter is, Byrne, we have no definitive way of knowing, but I think we can point to a couple of possibilities or likelihoods of of entry into this particular field. So I think, you know, farm machinery always plays a significant role, especially harvesting equipment. So if you've brought in a, a combine from the U.S. areas that have Palmer amaranth or any machinery, quite frankly, that can hold some soil to it that might have seed on it, um, that is a point of entry. So sanitation and cleaning of that machinery is critical. I think in this case, because it was a mixed operation, livestock operation, that brought in feed from other jurisdictions that any feed maybe originating from areas that have Palmer amaranth or, or even elevator screenings that people bring in either for bedding or for as a feed byproduct, like that's probably a higher probability of bringing in seed of Palmer amaranth. Those would be the two most likely scenarios. Yeah, birds could uh, fly over and crap it out, but probably more machinery or feed. So I want to talk about how we can control and ID this in a second, but hey, what does this look like in the field? I mean, th this is a growing plant. This can be six to eight feet tall, right? Yeah. So I think early on, and why you tend to identify it this time of year is early on, it, it's probably fairly hard to distinguish it from other common pigweeds. I think this is probably the most important point for your uh, viewers in that both the landowner and the, the agronomist at this location, you know, when they saw this plant, they're like, wow, this is a weird looking pigweed. This is unlike any other pigweed I've seen on this farm before. Uh, and that's usually a pretty good gut check to pursue either water hemp or palmer amaranth. And so, you know, there's about five things that I look at. Uh, if I'm trying to identify Palmer amaranth. And so the first is, yeah, I mean, this is a weird looking pigweed. Then there's these kind of five things I want to knock off because the reality uh, burn with water hemp and Palmer amaranth is uh, they're both very diverse in terms of their appearance in the field. Mm -hmm. Even within a field, they can look dramatically different. So there's not one feature that tells you automatically it's Palmer amaranth. There's probably four to five that if you check off, there's a high probability yeah. it's water ha or Palmer amaranth and you can can go to someone else to get confirmation. Awesome. So what are we looking for? Okay, so first and foremost, it's the length of the petiole. So the petiole is just what attaches the leaf blade to the stem of pigweed. And uh, on Palmer amaranth, it's pretty easy to find a petiole that is longer than the leaf blade. So if you fold over that petiole, it should peek over the top of the leaf blade. And so that is pretty easy to find on Palmer amaranth. I mean, you can find that trait on water hemp, uh, but it's pretty rare. And so that's why you look at some other features. The, the next feature I look to is the, the stem. Then there's two things on the stem burn. It's one, any lack of fuzz or hair. There might be some texture, some coarseness, um, but it's, it's hairless. And then also the stem itself is quite a bit larger than other pigweeds. Like this stem here is around two inches in diameter. Now other pigweeds on their own will get bigger stems, but comparatively Palmer amaranth size will be quite a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at leaf, uh, there's two things to look at at leaf. Um, one is they have kind of a diamond shape appearance, whereas water hemp is more like long and narrow. And, uh, and then lastly, some people refer to it as like a poinsettia type appearance. So if you kind of look down at the cluster of leaves, yeah, it kind of looks a little bit like a, a poinsettia. So those are kind of five things that if you check all those boxes, then I'd be taking it to someone like Francois Tardif. And then also um, there's a DNA uh, test that can confirm or at least give a high probability that, yeah, what you're IDing, what you're seeing is in fact Palmer am amaranth. So we did that process with this plant. Right. Those boxes got checked. 
We had other people look at it and say, yeah, this looks like Palmer. And then the DNA test said, yeah, high probability that this is Palmer. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about how to control this. Yeah. Um, U.S. farmers have had to go to every tool in the box yeah. to pull this off. Um, talk about uh, you, how they all come together to hopefully control a weed like this. Yeah, so I think we're fortunate in Ontario that a lot of good work in water hemp's already been done by Peter Sikkim and his group at uh, the Ridgetown Campus University of Guelph. So practically speaking, your approach or your best practices to manage water hemp are transferable to Palmer Amaranth. Um, and so on the herbicide end, it's, it's using that really effective soil applied herbicide. That is your first line of defense and then going through uh, with effective post emergent products. Now that might be switching, means that you might in soybeans have to switch to a herbicide tolerant technology to deal with that. Uh, luckily in corn, there are lots of options, but the key thing is this germinates and emerges over a fairly lengthy period of time. So you need both pre and post emergent herbicides to to mitigate any uh, additional recruitment. But I think the most important thing is like long term, we're not going to solve this out of the jug. So we need to be relying on other modes of action and 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 so things like cover crops, right? So cover crops after wheat harvest, cover crops after soybeans, if you're not going to winter wheat, those are important to kind of suppress recruitment and, and prevent more seed production. Tillage becomes a valuable tool in some environments to actually turn over soil um, so that you can reduce populations. And then quite frankly, in the cropping system, there's some crops that you know pigweed doesn't love as much. So I think to winter wheat, and winter canola. So those are two crops where you rare, rarely see a lot of amaranthus or yep. pigweed plants in them. So if you're not including those in the rotation, those are things to consider. But, but it really is about being pretty vigilant about removing any plants, whether it be by tillage, mowing, to produce seed, uh, to stop yep. seeds from producing and dispersing. Yeah. So you mentioned, obviously, the best way to probably control something like this is to keep it from dropping seed and yep. setting seed and getting growing. Um, with that in mind, what are you telling growers this fall as they're out sort of, you know, work of harvesting soybeans and scouting? What are they looking for? Yeah, so big picture is we found one plant. Are there more? Probably. Um, but right now we've only found one. So, uh, you know, this isn't widespread by any means. And it is, as you mentioned, super difficult to control. So our best control is prevention. And so the fall in soybeans or at corn harvest is now really the best time to, where this is going to be super obvious to identify. If you find it, uh, you know, pull it out, destroy it so that it's not setting seed and dispersing seed so that the problem becomes bigger. Well, Mike, uh, not the, uh, the happiest story to report, but hey, some great insights. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, always great to have you on Real Agriculture. Yeah, thanks for having me.